Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Every Thursday at 1 p.m. You can also find me on the Conscious Resistance Network on the YouTube channel as well, the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. So today we're going to be discussing... Oh, I'm your host, Anil Queer. <laughs> and today we're going to be discussing my um, a blog post I did recently uh, entitled GMOs are to food what Keynesianism is to economics. What are GMOs? It stands for genetically modified organisms, or in other words, anything which is not naturally occurring. They are created when scientists remove genes, change genes, or add genes from one species and forcefully insert it into another for the purpose of adding a desired effect or deleting an undesirable one. Just as in our modern-day interventionist Keynesian economics, which damages and worsens the economy through currency manipulation, currency creation, aka the mandrake mechanism, and interest rate fixing, when one attempts to manipulate the traits of living organisms that have taken many thousands or millions of years to evolve, the result is unintended or intended for the more sinister-minded, harmful effects for the organism being experimented upon, other organisms who interact with it in nature, as well as those organisms who consume it. Man did not create plants, animals, and the free market economy, and so nothing man does will improve the current affairs. Quite the opposite, in fact, occurs. The more intervention man employs in the natural plant, animal, and free market economic world, will only serve to exacerbate and lengthen any minor glitches that may present. Nature, as in free market economics, has many self-healing mechanisms that automatically correct itself with ease. Future distortions and irregularities cannot be foreseen by any politician, Nobel Prize-winning economist, or biotech scientist, no matter how savvy and clever. One glaring example of this is corn that has been modified to contain the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, which makes the corn fatal to insects and other pests. When they eat this GMO corn, it immediately destroys their stomachs and digestive systems. The biotech companies, however, tell us with indefatigable calmness this franken corn is harmless to humans. Are we to believe a company who, after destroying the biodiversity of a plant and animal species, proceeds to patent and reap enormous profits off of said species since it is no longer a natural organism but can now be considered a product and therefore subject to U.S. patent law? Therefore, any farmer found to be growing such plants on his farm, even if accidental by wind-blown seeds from passing trucks, would be subject of harsh legal actions for years that would, even if proven innocent, most likely bankrupt, said farmer. When pitted against the enormous deep-pocketed biotech companies such as Monsanto and their legion of lawyers, small organic farmers don't stand a chance. In addition to all this, one cannot even expect a fair trial from the judicial system, which is in itself a conflict of interest. Aside from the plain contradiction in terms of a branch of government adequately monitoring itself, this is further muddy, m muddied, muddled when one considers the revolving door of international bankers, politicians, congressmen, and corporate CEOs that is constantly swinging open. Did you know that Monsanto, one of the largest biotech corporations in the world, used to reassure the American people that dioxin, Agent Orange, and DDT were all safe? Did you know that much of the pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides that came into widespread use following World War II were formerly used as mustard gas and ammunition that were left over from the war? And now they are telling the people of the world that GMO food is not only safe for consumption, but also the solution to world hunger. 
Rest assured that, that polluting the sacrosanct heirloom gene pool passed down from generations, rendering it illegal for farmers to save seeds and saddling farmers with enormous debt, where from there is no escape. Um, where from escape is far from a solution to anything. In fact, just as with most destructive multinational corporations, with their powerfully irresistible lobbying capabilities, federal subsidies, and cartel formation, this is the kind of behavior that corporate fascism rewards luxuriously. Do not confuse this as being the result of an anarcho-capitalistic free market. The former rewards recklessness, speculation, and waste of resources. The latter rewards thrift prudence and efficient use of resources. They are beasts originating from different worlds. Your patronage is deserving of that institution which fosters life in all its manifestations. When you purchase something, you are voting for what you want to see more of in the world. Appreciate the dwindling power left in the purchasing power of your fiat paper trash currency. Whatever left whatever little is left of it. Buy local, buy from farmer's markets, buy raw dairy and raw fermented dairy, buy water-based fermented foods, buy raw honey. Be your own medical doctor, nutritionist, naturopath, and herbalist. Eat for the body you want, not the body you have. So I finish with a quote by Joel Saladin, a pretty famous biodynamic farmer, um, in the Midwest. We don't need a law against McDonald's or a law against slaughterhouse abuse. We ask far too much salvation by legislation. All we need to do is empower individuals with the right philosophy and the right information to opt out en masse. All right. So, GMOs. Um, an interesting topic. There's been a lot of um, a lot of marches recently. Uh, the March on Monsanto um, this year, last year, I believe, um, and uh, it's been very powerful. The the turnout. People are uh, you know speaking their mind against Monsanto. Um, however, the problem is not just Monsanto. Right. The problem is the monopoly on violence known as government that has authorized and legalized the crimes that corporations such as Monsanto, who receive sovereign immunity from government, um, perpetrate daily. Right. As with most problems, we have to not focus on the branch. We have to focus on the root. Right? This is, this is the, the concept of, um, you know, it's called the root branch theory, right, in, uh, in medicine. You know, you, you have the symptoms and you don't necessarily just treat the symptoms because, uh, of course, if you do that, you will get other more dreaded and profound harmful reactions, right? You, you know, this is the reason why when you have a cold, you don't just take a cough suppressant, you know, you don't just take a decongestant, you, you know. The reason, um, the reason that the body is coughing is to expel the pathogen. The reason that there's, you know, runny nose is, again, expelling the pathogen, right? So, so you take things that help to um, expedite that process, right? So, similarly, we have to realize that the enormous corporations that we see um, perpetrating crimes throughout the world, um, namely Monsanto, Syngenta, Dow, um, Chevron, um, BP, as in the BP oil spill, um, and not to mention Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, um, um, Capital One, um, 
you know, name, name your big corporation, your special interest group, and I will show you the connection that it has with government. All right? When a corporation such as Chevron pollutes the Amazon River in South America and destroys the habitat for the local villages and, you know, produces um, incredible um, health problems and rampant disease, you can see how those corporations are quite shielded, you know, through their, I mean, mostly through their um, status as a corporation, right? The corporation, a corporation itself is a legal fiction. It is something that is, um, you know, is created by government itself, right? So basically, you know, people incorporate so that they can shield themselves from um, <laughs> retaliation from people who this corporation might have harmed, right? Um, but you have to ask yourself, if you go into business and you truly believe in the products or services that you are producing for, for society, why, why would you need protection from government, from retaliation? Why... Why do you need to be shielded? And it's curious that people automatically assume that to incorporate is just natural as having a business. You know, you just incorporate and, uh, and you're shielded, right? But um, when you're able to... When you're able to be um, sued, you know, or, um, you know, charges are brought against you, it really... Um, it changes one's actions because it makes you vulnerable, right? You, you're putting out a service or a product and you stand by that service or product and you really believe in it because if you were to wrong anyone, you don't have protection. You don't have the shield, right? They can go at you. They can go after you, right? But as a corporation, you have a barrier. It's an artificial barrier between you and your company and they can go after the assets of your company and you are shielded, right? So this is what a corporation is, right? So, you know, we, in this article we're talking about GMOs, right? Focusing on Monsanto. Um, but we can just, just as well as focus on, you know, <laughs> we can focus on fractional reserve banking. We can, we can focus on the BP oil spill. Again, we could focus on the, the uh, destruction of the Amazon River. Um, again, through oil drilling. Um, you know, we, we could focus on any myriad of, of uh, detrimental effects that have resulted from corporations, you know, enormous international corporations that are completely immune to um, retaliation through, you know, legal retaliation by the people that has harmed, right? But, but just talking about GMOs, you know, some people say, well, GMOs is just, it's the proof that technology is progressing, you know, that we, um, you know, that we're improving food, right? Um, and I've been studying the, uh, the logical fallacies, and there is there is one such logical fallacy, which would be the appeal to nature, right? And uh, I actually started learning about this only after I, uh, I got very big into anarcho-capitalism and voluntarism. Um, and, uh, and so the appeal to nature is basically, um, it's the argument that it's natural, right? So basically, anything natural is good <laughs> or safe, right? Um, now, to an extent, I guess you could say that's true, right? Comparing Western medications to herbs or plants or fun fungi or, um, you know, a kind of natural medicinal substance, the, uh, the side effects are drastically decreased, right? They're, they're much, much less. But at the same time, you can't make the blatant generalization that all natural things are good because, of course, you know, you do have, you know, venom and poison. <laughs> and these are, of course, natural, you know, as, you know, not only animals have venom and poison, but also plants, right? So, so you, you can't 
make that generalization. Um, so there is the, the, the logical fallacy of the appeal to nature. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, that's something I'm still grappling with, you know, regarding GMOs. So, so I, don't really, I don't really give the justification that GMOs are harmful because of the appeal, you know, because I'm saying it's natural, right? Because you have the appeal to nature. Um, rather, I would say, and again, I wouldn't even advocate for a prohibition or ban on GMOs because again that's that's supporting government to bring about a solution right which if we if we say that that Monsanto which is itself a child of government um, developed GMOs how can you know how can we logically expect government to um, monitor and restrict itself right it just it doesn't happen, <laughs> you know. Our, just, just look at our national debt. Just look at our, you know, na you know, surveillance state. Just look at our, you know, police state. Just look at all the, all the countries we've invaded, right? So there is, you know, the idea that that government will limit itself or restrict itself is completely utopian and naive. And I urge everyone to um, get rid of that notion. <laughs> so, so I no longer believe that. Um, you know, the problem of GMOs uh, necessitates a government solution. It does not, right? Um, rather, I would say to any technology or product that I don't support, you know, I would, I would just say let the people speak, right? And the way they speak and the way they vote best is with their dollars, with their participation, right? With their purchasing of that product or service, right? So... You know, allow, give GMOs, you know, the proper light of day, the proper light of the free market. And we will see how it fares against, um, you know, the local food of the, uh, of the farmers, you know, small farmers near you, you know. That's why I say support the farmers markets, right? Because, because GMOs are inherently, um, how do you say unsustainable, expensive, inefficient, right? Uh, there's a great documentary um, where it discusses how the farmers in India, who I think in India, um, cotton is a really big uh, pr um, crop in India. So a lot of the Indian farmers, they sign contracts with Monsanto and they, to sell their... Um, GM cotton, right? Genetically modified cotton, and and they get into extreme, enormous debt, which is actually not not um, shocking, as as any farmer will attest to you. You know, uh, you know, you get this contract, and you're forced to go into debt, and you got to go into debt to buy the tractor and all the equipment, and so you're basically enslaved by debt, right? You have to keep coming back for more, and again, and then they have these. These terminator seeds, which basically self-destruct after one season, right? They, they don't come to um, bloom and produce seed for the next uh, generation. So they just basically self-destruct. And so, and so again, you're, you're beholden to the corporation, to Monsanto, to continuously purchase more and more seeds each year, right? Um, so, and, and again, not only that, but I guess of the... Of the seeds that don't self-destruct without the terminator gene, um, Monsanto has um, has made it, or the, along with the federal government, have made it illegal to save seed. I guess it would be in their contract with Monsanto, right? It's against contract to save seed for the next generation, which is a practice that has been done for time immemorial, for thousands of years. They have been saving seed, right? This is, this is how, you know, this is how farmers have sustained themselves, how have communities sustained sustain themselves. Uh, this is how you, um, it, you know, some people talk about um, the, you know, when I talk about GMOs, they say, well, we've been doing GMOs for, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? 
yeah, when they cross pollinate, when they mix certain breeds, that's GMO. That's tinkering, right? Uh, no, actually, it's not, right? That that would be um, that, yeah, that that would just be you know breeding, intergenerational breeding, or 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 cross pollination or whatever. Um, that is far far different than genetically modified organisms, which is in a lab, forcefully um, extracting a gene from one and forcefully injecting it into another. Notice the word force, right? <laughs> That's a word that if, you know, you talk, re talk about it regarding government, the word force is something that you would hear over and over and over again, right? The government is all about coercion and force and violence and brutality. Um, so, so the concept of GMOs, it's all about force. It's all about taking from one species that would never um, mix with another species and inserting it into the other species that is completely foreign. For example, um, a bacteria, gene from a bacteria, forcefully injected into corn, right? Producing a corn crop that has a poison that um, destroys like I think it explodes the stomachs of insects. However, they tell people that it's completely safe to eat. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, they, uh, I, I believe, um, they took they took a gene from from fish and they inserted it into tomato plant into a tomato plant, and in order to um, make the tomatoes more resistant to cold frost, right? Um, they, I think, I believe they've taken a gene from spiders and inserted it into goats, and, and in order to make their their the milk, you know, some kind of consistency like spider web, something like that. <laughs> so, so the imagination is is amazing, but at the same time, um, I mean, I guess it's it's interesting to to experiment with things like this, but to then turn around and say that something like that is safe to eat, that is a, um, that's an assertion that's amazingly, um, you know, it's, it's full of a lot of uh, uh, hubris, to say the least. Um, to think that, you know, various plants and fruits and vegetables have gone through thousands of years of uh, natural selection, you know, of, um, you know, um, transforming to, to, the, uh, to the crop that we see today, and then we can forcefully inject <laughs> a gene from a completely different species to another one and think that it's not going to have a, a problem or harmful effects is quite naive. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, just for the reason that we have no experience, right? GMOs have only been around for a little over a decade, I think. Um, and it's kind of hard to talk about GMOs with the older generation because, you know, before, I think before the 90s, like the word organic basically started in the early 90s, right? So before that, there was no such thing as organic, right? Everything was organic. But now that there is um, different you know, like, uh, you know, not to mention the pesticides, herbicides, insecticides that they use, um, that again will be absorbed by the plant and then, and then absorbed by us when we eat them. Um, but in addition to that, you have GMOs, right? So now it's necessary to assign an adjective called organic to distinguish that food from, uh, from organic. For, or, uh, yeah, distinguish, yeah, that food from the organic. And, and the, the strange thing is that we should really be, <laughs> you know, the adjective should be added on to the new one. It shouldn't be added on to the old, the old one, right? Because, you know, when you say food, that's what has been around for thousands of years. It's food, right? All right? You don't say, you know, the, the, the people thousands of years were eating organic food. No, they were just eating food, right? So... What well, we should say, we should assign a new adjective, right, to the new food, which would be, you know, genetically modified or transgenic or mutant <laughs> or Franken food, right? These are all um, 
completely acceptable names, I think, <laughs> that we could use to describe the, uh, the mutant varieties of, uh, of food that, that are being created right now. So to finish up my story, the, the, the cotton farmers in India, so they get into massive amounts of debt, right, through the purchasing of their of the seeds, all the equipment, right, and, and so they have to, you know, borrow money to pay off their debts and everything like that, and so their debt gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And in India, I'm not sure if it's the same here, but in India, if, if you um, acquire massive amounts of debt and you die, uh, the debt dies with you, right? Um, however, now Monsanto is, um, is in the process. I'm not sure if they, they were able, able to change it, but they're in the process of changing those laws or those customs in India so that when the farmer dies, the debt gets passed to their family, right? Wonderful. <laughs> um, so, and, 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 and incidentally, the way the farmers kill themselves most of the time is they drink the Roundup Ready um, pesticide that, that, um, that is provided and is necessary when using uh, GM crops, right? So, so the GM, another aspect of GM crops is that they are completely resistant to this Roundup Ready, right? So, so that's one way you can identify GM crops is by you know, spraying this Roundup Ready. Every other plant dies except the GMO, right? It's a very strange, <laughs> very unusual phenomenon. Yet it's safe to eat, I'm sure. Yeah, right. So another, another um, quite sinister method that that Monsanto uses, um, as I mentioned in the article, is um, you know to farmers who who live organically as much as possible. So the problem with living organically now is you know you have you know pollination occurring through the wind, right? Wind, you know, the seeds just get blown. So so what happens when a GMO crop uh, pollen? blows onto an organic field and pollinates and contaminates that field, right? Can you still call that food organic? And that is the problem that a lot of organic farmers face today is cross-contamination, right? That's really something that you can't really guard against. How do you, how do you protect against that? It's amazing. Um, so there's, there's that, and then there's the, the trucks uh, carrying these GMO seeds, that have occasionally blown off and onto, you know, a, uh, a farmer's field and began growing, and then once uh, somehow an agent from a, from from the corporation from Monsanto determines that a GMO crop is growing in their field without their permission, right? Because again, once nature has been um, tampered with, changed, right, um, tinkered with. Um, it the, the the law basically states that they can now it's a product right it's not something of nature it's now a product so now they can patent it right so anyone who grows their food without their express permission can suffer harsh legal consequences and that is exactly what happened to a lot of small organic farmers they've been crushed by um, by heavy legal um, uh, legal action, and, and it's quite sad because you know farmers they operate on a slow budget as, as it is, you know, low budget, and and so to slap them with a with a legal, um, you know, with a lawsuit, it's just um, it's just horrendous. They 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 just fold, they they crumble because they don't have the armies of lawyers and lobbyists, and they don't have an enormous budget. As somebody such as Monsanto does to um, to defend themselves. I mean, and even if they win, even if they are proven innocent, they are so crippled by debt. Just having gone through that legal process, you know, paying lawyers and court fees and things like that, that uh, many farmers just go bankrupt. As you know, as a result of that, it's quite sad. People who have been farming for you know decades or a hundred years or two hundred years um, just destroyed by, um, you know, by the legion of lawyers 
that that attack them, that you know from the uh, from Monsanto. So it's it's really it's really quite a tragic thing. Um, but this is this is what happens when we empower a small group of individuals um, with authority, right? Um, and, gov- and and this is what government is, right? It's just it's just belief in the myth of authority, right? And it all stems from there. So anyone who um, anyone who is in in position of power, right? Every, everyone perceives them to have power. Then you know they can they can create. Then on top of that, they they create all these you know these hydra heads of uh, various corporations that um, are able to do you know horrific atrocities with immunity, right? Immunity, sovereign immunity, right? It's called also called legal plunder. Um, so if you wish to end Monsanto, if you wish to end Chevron and BP and Bank of America and Capital One and Chase, okay, and J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Raytheon and Halliburton, if you wish to end all of these disastrous and destructive corporations, you should not, (laughs) you shouldn't complain to the corporations, you know, you shouldn't even complain to don't complain to Congress. <laughs> They're the ones that legitimized it, right? Monsanto recently, I think it was just last year, they passed legislation in the Monsanto Protection Act, which, again, asserted their immunity to lawsuits against, um, you know, uh, if, if somebody were to bring up a lawsuit against them alleging that GMO foods that they consumed harm them, they are immune to that. Immune. This is an amazing thing. If, if their crops were so beneficial and nutritious and healthy, why do they need protection from the U.S. government? Why do they need this immunity? If you really believe that your product or your service s- serves society, right, improves society, you don't need protection, right? Good ideas do not require force. This is the basic principle of volunteerism. So I'm going to end right there. Thank you very much for listening. This is Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care.